Uh, a man has worked at NVIDIA for the past seven years. He has worked in a variety of verification roles, including methodology, infrastructure, SOC level verification, unit level verification, and silicon bring up. He graduated from the University of Texas at Austin in 2012. And he likes yoga. He goes on hikes and he likes listening to podcasts. So over to you, Aman. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, uh, for the introduction. And uh, thank you, Sarah. Thanks for the opportunity to let me speak at DV Club. Um, the title of my talk today, as Mike mentioned, is using hardware verification methodologies to verify the boot room of a complex SOC. We are all verification engineers. Um, we are used to verifying hardware all the time. But today, let's talk about something slightly different. Let's go into the world of verifying a piece of code that resides on almost every chip out there, the boot room. Here is how I have organized this presentation. I've divided into three sections. Uh, in the first section, we'll talk about what a boot ROM is and how is it traditionally verified. Um, in the second section, we'll discuss how we used hardware verification methods to verify uh, boot ROM. And in the last section, we'll discuss results and just conclude with some final thoughts. Okay. So let's just jump right in and start with the first section, which is what is boot ROM? So I Googled and <laughs> as usual, everything is available on the internet. So I found a reasonable definition of what a boot ROM is um, uh, on Wikipedia. Um, boot ROM is a small piece of code embedded inside a processor chip. It contains the very first code which is executed by the processor on power on reset. Now, in these days, uh, these days, the SOCs that we have, boot ROM is executed mostly by a dedicated boot processor. Um, it is a fairly complicated piece of code. It has a lot of paths, um, and those paths are controlled by fuses and straps. Fuses and straps are, for this discussion, mostly I.O. pins that are used to control how the boot ROM will behave. Um, the overall intent of the boot process is to initialize or configure a chip. The boot ROM's goal, however, is to set the chip up for the next bigger stages of boot, like micro boot or bootloader. So it is the first part of the overall boot process. Um, here is an overview or a, a top level diagram of a typical SOC these days. There is a processor um, that is, um, here I'm labeling that as a boot processor. It can be a regular application processor of the chip also, but these days it's mostly a separate processor. The dark green box is the boot ROM. The boot processor executes the instructions in the boot ROM one by one. What, and when it is doing that, the boot processor is doing two important things. The first one is that it is initializing or configuring the rest of the SOC through this fabric, the fabric or the backbone or crossbar as it is usually called. And the second thing that it is doing, which is important for this discussion specifically, is that it is using this RAM connected to the boot process as a scratch pad. It is using that for stack or heap. Um, and importantly, the boot processor uh, uses the RAM to load the uh, code for subsequent stages of boot, like micro boot or bootloader, from a boot device into the RAM and then executes that code later after boot ROM is finished. Okay. Um, here is a flow of the boot ROM. I'm showing it in a very linear fashion from left to right, but it is really not the case. Um, this is just a high level picture. From the left, we say that we start the, with the chip deassertion, we sense the fuses, we sample the strap, which is just to say that we record the values of the current parameters or configuration that we want to run the boot ROM in. Then we deassert the reset of the boot processor and boot ROM's execution starts. Until now, whatever has happened is through hardware sequencing, and then the boot ROM takes over. Now, boot ROM it basically initializes the various parts of the chip one by one. And so 
uh, you know, as you can see here, you know, you enable the clocks and pads, then you enable the fabric and memory controller, then you initialize the boot device, then you load the code from the boot device into the RAM, then you authorize and decrypt that code, and then you change program counter to that code. These are referred to as boot stages, and this is a terminology we will use later. So the boot process is composed of a lot of boot stages. Um, now, the question is, how is boot ROM traditionally verified? Um, traditionally, at least at NVIDIA and probably at most other companies, uh, the verification of boot ROM is done in two, two ways. One is by firmware teams directly or by hardware teams indirectly. When firmware teams are verifying boot ROM, their goal is high level functionality of the boot ROM. They are not employing you know, constraint random verification or always on checking and things like that. They just enumerate important cases uh, in a test plan and just execute that, making sure that the chip is able to boot up or not. Um, hardware teams, on the other hand, their main goal is to verify the hardware of the SOC they run some SOC verification tests with the real boot ROM, thereby giving some coverage of the boot ROM code and finding bugs there. Most SOC verification tests, however, are run with a fake boot ROM to speed up the boot process because their intent is to verify most of the rest of the operation of the SOC. Now, as you can see, this is clearly not enough. Um, we need to do better. Um, and the answer, the question is, can we do better? And the answer is yes, we can. And that brings us to the second section of our discussion to use hardware verification methods. Now it is important to note that boot ROM is etched into silicon, so bugs in the boot ROM will cause a respin of the chip. So let's see how, let's see what hardware verification methods we used. And that is the trifecta of constraint random stimulus, always on checkers and functional and code coverage but this time for verifying the boot ROM and not the hardware. So let's dive into them one by one. First is stimulus. Um, when verifying boot ROM, we are not writing any new sequences. Uh, boot ROM itself is a giant sequence with lots of parameters which control the paths taken inside the boot ROM. Um, so what we did was to create a configuration object that contained these parameters. These parameters are, you know, could be, this is a very short list here, uh, you know, which boot device is going to be used later? Is the boot ROM going to be using a secure mode or a non-secure mode? What type of reset caused the boot ROM to execute, for example? Um, and when we put these configuration variables into the configuration object, um, we also needed to add constraints because um, these modes, all of them are not, the cross product of all of these modes are not legal, some of them are illegal, so we had to add constraints. So we randomize this configuration object that yields uh, multiple valid combinations of these parameters, enabling us to execute the boot ROM in various possible configurations. Um, so the second aspect of uh, using hardware verification methodologies is to use a checker. Now, what was the intent of the checker? We wanted to verify the order in which the boot stages are happening. We wanted to verify the SOC configuration at each boot stage. Um, we wanted to verify you know, whether the secure keys that are being loaded um, are cleared after every boot stage um, so that you know, we don't leak those security keys. Um, another interesting point of verification was to verify that the boot stages finish in the required amount of latency. Um, and so on. So for this, this type of verification, for these type of things that we wanted to verify, what was it that, uh, what information did we need in our checker? So here is the diagram that we saw earlier again. Um, there were four pieces of information that I'm, I've labeled on the right and I'll go through each one of them and say, where did we get that information from? The first one was the notification of boot stage completion, and that we could get by looking at this interface, the processor RAM interface, and I'll tell you how in the next slide. Second was we wanted to look at the configuration transactions being sent into the SOC. For that, we looked at, excuse me, for that we looked at the boot processor fabric interface. Then we needed to know what the register values were inside SOC blocks. For that, we used UVM RAL, which was uh, which had access to 
um, cross-module references in the SOC. And we also needed to know the configurations that the boot ROM is using currently and that we could get from our configuration object. Um, so going back to that first point as to where did we get the notification for boot stage completion from, it turned out that there was a debug feature that as the boot processor is executing boot ROM, it was writing to a particular location in the RAM um, with the information about which boot stage was being finished. So we used that feature for our verification purposes. We looked at this interface, put a monitor on this interface and said whenever this particular address, this is just a dummy address, was being, ex was being written to, what was the data being written to? And that data would give us an idea of, okay, this boot stage has finished now. And these were called events, boot events, as they were happening. So now that we have established what type of uh, information was required and what, what was ac the intent of the checker, let's see the architecture of, a ch of the checker. This was a fairly typical UVM-based checker, which was using monitors on various interfaces um, to send information to the checker using analysis ports. Um, on the left is the processor RAM interface. On the right is um, the processor fabric interface. Um, and we also had a raw interface to probe into the design because there were some cases where we did not have a monitor. This does make the checker uh, slightly non-reusable, but we didn't have avenues to reuse the checker because this was being done already at an SOC level environment. Um, then we had a register bl interface block, which was basically a layer over UVM RAL. Um, we exposed a few APIs uh, to, through which the checker could uh, query the status of various register fields and bit values. And we also had um, you know, various data structures in the checker, specifically one of them was the configuration object that we talked about. So then there are a few interesting features of this checker, which I'm not going into detail today. Um, I have listed them here. I have moved those slides into the backup slides, uh, the slides that have details of these. You can uh, feel free to look at the details later. Um, the, the, web, the, the entire presentation will be uploaded on the TVS website. Um, now let's move on to the third part of using hardware verification methodologies, which is coverage. We used both code coverage and functional coverage. Um, now remember this code coverage is not code coverage of RTL. This is of the boot ROM code itself. At the time we were doing this, there was no commercial tool available that could um, provide us the coverage for boot ROM. What we did was we actually wrote a tool which would take in trace logs uh, of the processor execution, which is basically a log telling you um, functions as they are being executed um, by the boot ROM. For ARM processors, this is the tarmac file. And we collected a bunch of them from various tests. Um, and then we also provided this tool, the disassembled boot ROM uh, from the from elf command again for, for ARM. Um, the tool basically analyzed this data and created a database. And through a front end, a web page, um, we could visualize how the various function calls and lines in the code, uh, in the bootram code, were being executed. Um, I have um, garbled the lines here just for IP reasons, but um, essentially there is a name of the method, name of the function call, and then there is how many times it was called. Through this process, the simple line coverage process, we were able to actually find a lot of dead code in our um, boot ROM. Uh, for functional coverage, this was again very simple. It's a little unusual to use functional coverage this way. Um, we of course covered the boot events or the boot stages as they were happening uh, to make sure all of them happen. But we also wanted to ensure that all the valid configurations um, are being done. Uh, are being covered. So we wrote cover groups that just had crosses of valid combinations and we randomized, uh, we sampled this, uh, this cover group just after um, randomizing the configuration object itself. All right, so with that, the question is how did it go? That brings us to the last part where we'll share some results. Um, we actually 
found quite a few bugs. And this is fairly typical. We found a lot of bugs in our testament itself. And we found a lot of bug in the specification. For example, the specification said, these are the registers that should be restored after warm boot, but they were not all getting restored um, in the real boot ROM. And that was a documentation bug. We actually found quite a lot of bugs in the boot ROM itself. Um, there were, these are a few examples. Uh, the boot ROM was not enabling, uh, was enabling clocks that were not required for a few modes. Um, boot ROM was not locking all the security key slots um, that it should have. And in the, in the process of this, we actually found a very few hardware bugs also. So this is indirect verification of hardware using boot ROM verification. Um, so with this, this is my last slide. Um, the final thoughts on how this process went. We found bugs, which is good, which is the holy grail of verification engineers. Um, we actually collaborated a lot with, with the firmware teams team through this process, which is not what we had done before. The firmware team would work separately, especially with respect to verification. We identified some dead code uh, implying ROM size reduction. That was of course helpful. Um, there is still a lot of scope to improve. You know, for example, we used the entire, the SOC level test bench for doing this. We could have used a smaller level test bench. We uh, only employed like line coverage or functional coverage was fairly basic, but this was much better than legacy. Um, and especially this was a very high bank for bug when a new core uh, was being brought up, which was the case for us. We were uh, coming up with a new boot process in that chip. And the very important takeaway is that these concepts are actually reusable to verify other pieces of on-chip firmware. So any on-chip firmware could use these methodologies to verify that on-chip firmware. With that, that was my last slide. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Aman. Um, you were perfectly on time as well. Thank you. <laughs> thank um, you. As, as a man noted as well these, a lot of these talks today because we've got four talks uh, uh we originally had five talks we're only 15 minutes each um but some of the, the speakers have supplied more detail in this in the slides that we'll put on the website so um thank you mom for any questions well yeah we have one question from from bristol yeah yes yeah, so just uh, uh i was wondering uh in the so when we do classic uh, method test uh, uh, system verification the boot rom is quite a string version so instead of supposing your it will be the full boot rom so a test uh, how long was going uh, to last the runtime of the test and then the regression uh, so yeah the, how long take for the full regression yeah did you get that question Yes, I think the question is how long did your tests take and the entire regression suite. So yes, because we were running the real boot ROM, these tests would take fairly long. I remember times from six hours to days, like multiple days, and it depended on which boot device, for example, was going to be used later, like if we were using USB as a boot device later there was a lot of code to be downloaded from the boot device into the RAM. So the process would take fairly long, but there were boot devices like EMMC, which were shorter. Um, when we disabled secure modes, you know, our, our tests would finish within six hours. So they were fairly long tests, but uh, overall, I think the bank for buck was pretty high. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.